You're listening to a sermon originally recorded by Schweitzer United Methodist Church in Springfield, Missouri. Check us out online at sumc.co. And if this sermon blessed you, be sure to share it with someone else. Thank you so much for listening. Now, on to the message. Good evening. My name is Jake Hotchkiss. I'm an associate pastor here at Schweitzer. Merry Christmas. If you're new with us tonight or if you've come from a long way, I want to know about it. I've got two Andy's gift cards. If you don't know what Andy's is, it's the best custard in the world. Um, if you're lucky, there's actually still some money left on these puppies. <laughs> and uh, so who came from the furthest? That's the question. All right? Do we have anyone from out of town? Raise your hand if you're from out of town at all. Okay, back there. Okay, out of uh, how far away? 200 miles? How about you guys back there? Cape Gir- how far is Cape Girardeau? Anyone? <laughs> Anyone else from out of town? Kentucky? That's definitely farthest. I think you're the winner. Anyone further than Kentucky? Okay, come on up. All right, no, I'll come to you. How about that? I'll come to you. You are very, very welcome. <laughs> All right, we are now going to get started. If you would, turn your attention to Scripture with me. We're reading from Luke chapter 2. We've been in chapter 1 for four weeks. We're finally to chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. The New Living Translation, here we go. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was a governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. That would be the fulfillment of a prophecy, by the way. So God's got some pretty interesting timing there. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried to the village, and they found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby, lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Last January, I got caught in a snowstorm driving to Kentucky uh, for Kentucky, uh, for uh, Asbury Seminary. Are you familiar with it? All right, a bunch of us pastors here went to Asbury. Um, So I got to go out there a couple times a year, and uh, it just so happened that the one snowstorm I think they had last year was when I was on my way there. And uh, so I'm, I'm halfway through Indiana, and there's this uh, stretch of about 80 miles where there's nothing, right? There's no exits. You pass the one exit, and you know you're not getting to another one for a while, so you got to plan accordingly. Well, the snowstorm hadn't quite hit yet, but I, I kid you not, I, I pass that last exit for about 80 miles, and it just hits. Boom! It's huge. I, for the next two and a half hours... I'm going 25 to 30 miles an hour on the interstate. I run out of windshield wiper fluid for the first time in like nine years, right? And I've got, I've got snow in the, you know, and I just can't see anything. I'm trailing the car behind me by like 30 feet, knowing just so I can see their taillights. I just want to know I'm not alone, you know? And if they go off the road, I'm going to follow them. It's just a nightmare, you know? And you're gripping the steering wheel for three hours. It's stressful, horrible. It's horrible. 
But I remember the feeling of seeing lodging and that relief. Oh, God, thank you for getting me here. Only to be irritated, you know, 20 minutes later that I wasn't yet in Kentucky. But I stayed at, at the lodging that night um, and was, was really blessed to, have, to get through that and have a place to stay. But, you know, I remember thinking that whole time, God, I'm, I'm in seminary. Like, I'm traveling to seminary for you to be a better pastor, to help people grow. And, like, I'm doing this. It's a very godly thing that I'm doing. Come on, right? Give me some credit here. <laughs> uh, so very, uh, can you not make this trip a little bit more convenient, all right? Could you not have had some better time here? Why, 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 why this inconvenience? God, help me out. But here's what I'm learning in life, is that God is not too terribly concerned with convenience. He's just not. He's really concerned with timing, but he is not too terribly concerned with convenience. And if you don't believe that just because of my measly little, you know, singular event story, listen to this. That even Mary, even the woman bearing the Son of God, God's own child, may not have been caught in a snowstorm, but this woman was about to pop. She is nine months pregnant, right? And this stupid decree, a decree comes out from the Roman emperor saying, we got to take a census. What even is a census? You know, we got to know how many people live in the Roman Empire, so you're going to have to travel however many miles, hundred for days or whatever, when you're about to pop, when you're about to give birth to the Son of God. God, could you not wait until it's a little bit more convenient. And then, of course, you're on the road, and Jesus is just knocking. He's like, I'm coming out. And she's like, can you not wait until we got a place to stay? And God's like, no, I don't care. It's time. I don't care if you don't have lodging. She did not have lodging. The Son of God was born in a manger. And you know what? Until this year, I didn't realize a manger is a cattle trough. Do you guys know that? That's a really nice word for a cattle trough. God does not care very much about convenience. He cares about timing. And then there's the shepherds being all responsible and stuff, protecting their sheep, you know, watching out for their flock, doing what they're supposed to do. The angel says, a Savior has been born, and you will recognize him by this sign. You'll find him in a manger, blah, 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 blah. And if I'm the shepherds, I'm going like, I'll recognize him. How can I recognize him if I don't go see him? I got work to do here. You know what I mean? I, can I just praise him from afar? That's great the Savior is born, but do I really have to leave my responsibilities here? That I'm, do I have to leave my work? Do I have to leave my home and go travel just to see what you told me about? I believe, all right? I see the angels' chorus. I believe. Do I really need to go see for myself? That's just horribly inconvenient. But God bless those shepherds who didn't think that way. Rather than just get back to work, Rather than just giving thanks and praising God from afar, they hurried. You hear that? They hurried. They ran with haste to go see from the, for themselves that the Savior had been born, to worship. God bless those shepherds. If there's anything we can learn from this story, it's that God's not incredibly concerned with convenience. And as long as we're waiting for things to become convenient, for the stars to be aligned, for all of our responsibilities to finally be taken care of, right? For the timing to be right in any way, shape, or form for us to finally have a roof over our head or, or to get into the new apartment or the new house or to finally get that new job or move to the new city or to have a kid. or you know, if We're, we're going to miss the point that the timing is now. It is today. The Savior has been born. You hear me? timing is now. We cannot wait for the timing to become convenient. That's what Christmas is all about. There will never be a perfectly convenient time to let God enter into your life. I want to illustrate this point just a little bit further. Uh, There's a guy who works here at Schweitzer named Scott, and he allowed me to share this story with you. Uh, It's really close and personal, but it's it's awesome. Um, His wife of, I don't know how many years, they were together a long time, Um, but three and a half, four years ago, she passed away of cancer. She'd been battling with cancer for five years at this point, and uh, this was eight days before her death. They obviously didn't know this at the time, but she was at their home, uh, and his four, their four kids were there at their home with him, 
as well. And you know how it's like when families to the house, it's just busy and crazy and whatever. And he had spent his time with God for the day, you know, done a devotion and whatever. And um, he just felt God knocking at the door saying, I need to talk to you. And he's saying, God, I've got other things to do. I'm busy. I mean, there's family here. There's, 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 you know, and he's incredibly stressed out about his wife and her state of health and no one in the family's doing great. And God's just saying, look, I know your family's here. Make some time for me. I need to talk to you. He just had this really strong impression in his soul. So he told his, told his family, I got to go for 10 minutes and just lock myself up in a room and go talk to God. Three and a half hours later, he came out of the room and what had happened in that three and a half hours was he had been wrestling with God because God told him, I want you to tell your wife that if she's ready to go, she has your permission to die. And you can imagine how difficult that would be for a man to tell his wife to let go. Um, you can imagine why he wrestled with God, but he gave God that time and that's what God said. And he made a deal with God. He's like, I'll tell her that if you can get everyone out of my house, thinking there was no way God would be able to do that. Um, and like 20 minutes later, everyone was gone. <laughs> and so he had that conversation with his wife and they cried and cried. And she said, you don't know how badly I've needed to hear you say that. So then uh, shortly after, not quite a week later, he was sitting around the table with his kids and he knew he had to tell them what he had told her. And so four kids, and he said, guys, this is what I told your mom. I told her that she could let go. And one by one, I kid you not, they all said how they had had the exact same conversation with her that week without knowing the, other, the others had done so. God had spoken to each one of them in the same way within a week's time frame. And she heard it from every one of her family members. And I'm telling you, God's timing is not always convenient, but it can not wait. We can talk all day about how inconvenient it is for us, but what about for God? Can't we trust a God who left the riches of heaven for this, for this world, sinful, broken world? To be born as a baby in a cattle trough, into a poor family, to be persecuted literally from his birth. I mean, like if you read on, you find King Herod sent people to find out where Jesus was so he could kill him as an infant, right? Like, that's the kind of life that God knew he was taking on. He left the riches of heaven for that. You talk about his crucifixion being a big sacrifice. How about his birth? To become a baby, to become vulnerable, right? To know that he would live a life of poverty and persecution, and humility and servitude. To eventually, of course, be crucified, give his life for us as well. Look, if I'm God, I'm gonna wait till 2018, I'm gonna find a family in like Beverly Hills that's really, uh, you know, they're like, they go to church, they're good Christians. I'm gonna be born into that family, into a Christian lifestyle and find a way to save the world that way. But no, God says, no, it can't wait. I'm not gonna serve a convenience, Are you kidding me? Can't we trust a God that loves you that much? God says, no, I love you so much that I will not concern myself with comfort or convenience at all. That's how badly I want you. That's how badly I want you to know.